Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for your word. We ask you to open up our understanding. Help us to understand what the Spirit is saying to us. Plant the seed deep within our heart and bring forth good fruit. Good fruit that will honor you. And God's people said, Amen. 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 The God to whom we belong and to whom we serve is a tripart person. You know what that means? A tripart person? It means it's three people, one identity. Three in one. Now, you ask me to explain it, I can't. I, I've never met anybody who could fully explain what that means. But there's lots of examples out there. God has put examples out in his creation to show us, give us an idea. For example, have you ever picked a three-leaf clover? Hello? Have you picked a three-leaf clover? What, what you got, you have one plant, one stem with three equal leaves. Yeah. How about, how about water? Water comes in three forms. Water can come in solid form, a liquid form, or a vapor form. But it's all water. It's all water. Sometimes I heard people use the example uh, an apple. I didn't bring an apple with me. But if I held up an apple, how many apples would you see? One. But, it, but it's skin, it's pulp, it's meat, and it's a core. Three in one. So there's lots of examples out there, not good ones, but there's examples out there how that God is one and three at the same time. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We call it what? The Trinity. The Trinity. Of all these three beings, most believers know or understand the least about the third member of the Godhead. God the Holy Spirit. And you know that's strange? Because he's the one you're in contact with most. He's in contact with you more than the other, than the Father and the Son. And yet we understand him the least. Consider according to what's revealed in the Word. Let me ask a couple of questions. Where is God the Father now? That's, that's a question. Where's God the Father now? He's in heaven. What's he doing? Sitting on the throne. And as he's sitting on the throne, what is he doing on the throne? That's it? Just having a conversation with everybody? No, he's doing more than that. He's ruling the universe. He's ruling creation. He's ruling his kingdom. And believe me, that's a full-time job. Where's the God the Son? On his seated on his right hand. What's he doing? It will be one of these days. He's kind of busy right now. He's our great high priest. He's interceding for you. That's a powerful thought, folks. The Son of God is interceding for you. You can't find a better interceder than that. You can try for yourself if you want. I'd much rather have Jesus speak for me to the Father, wouldn't you? Not only that, he's the mediator of the new covenant. Everything that's promised in this covenant, this testament, this word of God, he's there to make sure it's being honored and carried out. So you can count on it. You can count whatever's written in here, you, this covenant, you can count on it because Jesus is making sure it is. Not only that, he is the head of the church. He's directing his body. Where is God the Holy Spirit? He's in the world, this world, and he's in us. Two places. I remind you that when you receive Christ into your life, invite him into your heart, the Holy Spirit comes with him. He's the one that plants Jesus' nature in your heart. He has a big job to do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it's a question. What? Don't you know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? He lives inside you. Don't you know that? What's he doing? 
Well, the Holy Spirit right now is the Godhead's representative on this earth. He is the, the Trinity's active agent on this earth. That's what he's doing. That's why he's here. We said he, he's in the world. Do you know what he's doing in the world? The Holy Spirit is active, reproving or convicting the world of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. Why? So that men and women, boys and girls everywhere, can repent and be saved. He's the one out there that's drawing them into Jesus. You may be the mouthpiece. You may be the avenue he uses, which is wonderful. But a person can't get saved without the Holy Spirit's action, drawing them and revealing Jesus to them. You know, I'm sure you heard people say so often, well, I found Jesus when I was 10 years old, 15 years old. I found Jesus. He had a meeting here there. No, you didn't. He found you. The Holy Spirit found you. And there's something else to be thankful. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for finding me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for bringing me to Jesus. Thank you for showing and telling me about Jesus. He's also in us. And he's doing a number of things according to the will and the purpose and the design of God the Father and God the Son. He's the active agent here in your life and on this earth. So the Holy Spirit lives in us. He's an integral, integral part of our lives. Yet many people, many believers seem to relate to him least compared to the Father or the Son. Okay. Why is that? Why is that? Well, I think we can more easily and readily relate to God the Father because we understand the term Father. We, we understand the concept of Father. We know what the role of a father should be. Also because all of us, every person here, has had a father or has a father. Now has one or had one. So we know what a father is because I had one. And I've experienced a relationship, a father-daughter, a father-son relationship, whether it was good or bad, whether it was long or short, whether it was close relationship or distance, Somewhere along the line, you had a relationship with the person you call a father. It's also more easily and readily able to relate to God the Son, the Lord Jesus, because he lived among us. He actually came and lived among us. John 1 and 14, you know it. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld its glory. The Glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He came and lived among us. He, he uh, did what he, we do. He experienced what we experienced. He felt what we felt. He understands what it's like to be human like us. So we can relate to that. Okay. Today he exists in a form, a resurrected form. And we can sort of picture that. I've seen some beautiful pictures of Jesus in resurrected form. And not only that, I've known some people that have actually seen him in that resurrected form. So we can relate to all that. It makes us easy to. But you know, it's hard to relate to a spirit. It's easy to relate to fathers, easier to relate to the son, but it's hard to relate to a spirit. Okay? You can't really do that very well, or we don't want to do it. Let me assure you something. The Holy Spirit is real. And he's not some mystical force out there in the universe. He is a real, live person. And I'd like to just share with you three truths, leave with you three truths about the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some of this stuff you already know. But there's some things I'd like you to remember. Number one is that the Holy Spirit is not inferior to the Father or to the Son in any way. He's equal to them all. In all things. The Holy Spirit, like the Father and Son, is eternal. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's holy. That's his name. He is just. He is perfect in every way, just as a Father and Son is. So don't relegate him to a lower position. Don't relegate him to some subordinate position in the Godhead. 
sometimes the way we talk about the Holy Spirit and think about him, we think God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We put him third. Okay. That's not how the Godhead works. Here's how it works. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All equal. All equal. Secondly, the second thing I want you to know is that the Holy Spirit loves you just as much, just as deeply, just as passionately as the Father and Son does. Do you believe the Father loves you? Do you know that? Do you know how much the Father loves you? Do you believe Jesus loves you? Well, I want you to know the Holy Spirit loves you just as much. Just as much. Well, how do I know that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Two of them I'll give you. One, you have to understand something about Scripture. When the Scripture uses the term God, sometimes it talks about the Godhead, sometimes it talks about an individual person of the Godhead. To give you an example, Genesis 1 and 1. Anybody quote that to me? What does Genesis 1 and 1 say? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. He uses the word God. Did you know that it is the Hebrew word Elam, Elohim? And Elohim is a plural word. It's talking about more than one person. In the beginning, more than one person created this world. And that's how the creation was done. That, that's how the Godhead works. God the Father... God the Father, he, what will I say? He conceives. He plans things. He wills certain things. God the Son, he fulfills them. He creates them. God the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit applies what the Son did. That's how the Godhead works. The Father conceives, the Son fulfills, the Holy Spirit applies. That's how salvation works. Who conceived the idea of salvation? It came from the Father's mind. It came from the Father. Who carried it out? The Father didn't die on the cross. Jesus carried it out. Who takes what Jesus did on that cross and applies it to your life? The Holy Spirit does. That's how they work together. Uh, how about John 3.16, though, when it says, God so loved the world that he gave his own... Who is he talking about? Not all three. Not all three. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That God, the term God there, is referring to the Father. So what I'm trying to tell you is there are times in Scripture where the Godhead, all three members of the Godhead are God. Talk about God. Sometimes it uses the word God in just one part or one person in the Godhead does something. Okay. Do you understand? I've got lots of examples. But I want to look at John 4, 1 John 4 and 8. This verse you know quite well. It says, God is love. Who are they talking about? Who are they talking about? I'm talking just about the Father. Is the Father the only one that's love? I'm talking just about the Son. Is the Son the only one that's love? Or are they talking about all three members of the Godhead? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is love. That's what we're talking about, all three, okay? All three are applied in this particular verse. In Romans 8 and 9, I'll just give you a couple of examples to make sure you catch hold of this. Paul talks about, he starts off by saying, I am persuaded, then he gives a whole pile of things. I'm persuaded that this and this and this and this and this can nothing, never separate us from the love of God. In other words, what he's saying is that nothing can separate us from the love of the Father, from the love of the Son, and from the love of the Holy Spirit as proven at the cross. In Romans 15 30, Paul refers to the love of the Spirit. I want you to know the Holy Spirit loves you just as much as the Father and the Son does. second reason why I say that is because look what the Holy Spirit has to put up with. 
I hate to tell you, but living inside us is not always enjoyable. Sometimes we take him places where we shouldn't. He doesn't want to go. Sometimes we say things he'd rather not hear. There are times we bring things into our life that are not godly or acceptable or pleasing to him. This carnal nature is constantly at war with him. And sadly, at times in our lives, we ignore the Holy Spirit. We resist him. We avoid him. We disappoint him. We even grieve him. And yet, he doesn't leave us. He doesn't say, oh, look what that person did. Ah, I'm done with them. That's it. I'm finished. I'm packing my bags. I'm under here. I'm gone. He never says that. He doesn't leave you. Why? Say it again. Exactly. Because he loves you so much. He puts up with all sorts of things. I know I wouldn't. So I think maybe... I don't know about you, when I get home, there's so much I want to do and, and thank the Lord and worship the Lord and so on, but I hope that I can find time to saunter over to the Holy Spirit and say, thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for not leaving me when I did that stupid thing. When I said that, thank you for sticking with me. He must love you in order to do that. Truth number two I lost reading number two. Hang on for a minute. I'll skip to reason number three because I can't find reason number two, okay? If I find it, I'll come back to it in a minute. One, I remember one. He's not in fear to the Father or the Son. Number two, he loves you just as much as the Father and Son do. Reason number three, did you know you can commune and fellowship with the Holy Spirit just like you do with the Father and Son? Amen. You can. Do you include him in things in your life? Do you include him in events and decisions and happenings? Do you, you include the Father, I'm sure. I'm sure you include the Son. Do you include the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, what do you think? Holy Spirit, what should I do? Holy Spirit, what in the world's going on? Do you include him in the communication and fellowship? Remember something, it's him, it's his voice, it's his promptings, it's his urgings, it's his leading that you hear inside you. It's not Jesus talking to you. It's the Holy Spirit in you talking to you on behalf of Jesus. Jesus tells them what to say and the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. That's his part. That's his part in the the whole scheme of things. Understand what I'm getting at this morning is we understand him least and we should understand him most because he has more active things in your life than any other part of the Godhead. There's a reason for it. So how comfortable are you hearing the voice of the Spirit? How comfortable? Do you recognize when the Spirit's talking to you? I'll give you a hint. It sounds like your voice. It sounds exactly like your voice. If you think you hear some strange, weird voice talking in there, that's not you. It's almost like I'm talking to myself. No, when you're a born-again believer and you're walking with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is talking to you. So listen. Listen. How many things has the Holy Spirit sought to guide you in? To lead you? To warn you? And we've missed it. Because we're not listening. We don't recognize that voice. We think, well, that's me talking to myself. Hmm? When you're born-again believer, the Holy Spirit talks to you a lot if you're smart enough to listen. And he'll guide and direct you in all truth. That's what Jesus said. But know something important. While the Holy Spirit seeks to commune and fellowship with you, he does not seek our worship. 
He does not seek to promote himself. You'll never find the Holy Spirit seeking you to worship him. And honor him and put him on the throne of your life. He does not seek to promote himself. In everything he does, the Holy Spirit has one purpose in your life. It's to glorify the Father and Son. That's his whole purpose, his whole aim, his whole goal is to glorify the Father and the Son and to carry out their purposes and their wills and their plans. And in return, the Father and Son honor and glorify the Holy Spirit. They do. There's perfect unity in the Godhead. There's no competition whatsoever between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect unity. The Holy Spirit doesn't seek our worship. He seeks to guide us in our worship. And he will always guide you to Jesus. Nor do we pray to the Holy Spirit. We are instructed to pray to the Father through the Son. That's what the scripture says. John fifteen sixteen. Whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, Jesus said, he will give it to you as long as it lines up with his will. So if you hear someone praying to the Holy Spirit, they're on the line. Now the Holy Spirit will help us in our prayer life for sure, big time. But he doesn't seek to be the center of your prayer. He seeks to lift up Jesus as the answer. He'll always point to Jesus as the answer. Now, in Scripture, there's three terms that we use to describe what happens when the Holy Spirit comes into your life in every believer. Give me a second here. Understand what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to show you and help you understand how important the Holy Spirit is in your life. Okay. And that there are so many Christians that have no idea what he does for you. Have no idea what part of your life he is and wants to be. And it's not to glorify him, it's to help you understand how it works how the Father uses the Holy Spirit in your life, how the Father uses, how the Son uses the Holy Spirit in your life, what He does. I want you to become more comfortable with the Holy Spirit, more relaxed. I want you to appreciate Him. I want you to enjoy Him. And you have to know a little bit of what He does and how He works in order to do that. Now, there's three terms in Scripture that the Bible describes how He works in your life. And I find many Christians are confused with them. It confuses them. The first one you'll find in um, uh, Scripture, like Ephesians 5.18, where Paul says, and be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. That word filled, the Greek word, paletho, means to supply as much of something as can be contained. It means to occupy the whole. Let me show you. I could probably illustrate it better. This is you. You got saved, you're all cleaned up inside. The Holy Spirit comes into your life when you, when you got saved right away. What does he do? He begins to fill you. We make one mistake. We say, this is how much of the Holy Spirit I've got. You've got all the Holy Spirit. You, he, when he comes in at the moment of salvation, he comes in totally. 10% yes. of them doesn't come in. 50% yes. doesn't come in. The total Holy Spirit comes in. You have all the Holy Spirit. Now that is not what it's all about. The question is, how much of you does he have? How much of you does he have? In this particular case, the total Holy Spirit's there, but he doesn't have all of me. There's room, more room for him. I need more of him. I need to be filled. Fill me, Holy Spirit. 
Spirit. Come into my life. I want to know you more. I want to know you better. I want more things that you have for me. Fill me, Holy Spirit. And that's what goes on so often your whole life. You wonder sometimes at a service where you're drawn to the altar and you just come and stand in his presence. Fill me, Holy Spirit. More. More. And the reason you can have more is I gave you more. I gave you more of me to fill. I gave you more of me to fill. That's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what I want you to know is that is a process. It's a process, an ongoing thing. It's possible for you to be filled today more than you were filled last week or the week before last year. And I want this coming week to be filled more, this coming year. As my life progresses, I want more of the Spirit to fill me. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is to give Him more of me. So go ahead, Holy Spirit. Work on me. Take those things out of my life. I give you my temper. I give you my anger. I give you my desires. I give you all these things that's me that's causing a problem. Get rid of them. Take them away from me. And then fill me more of your spirit. I want more of your spirit. Okay. The more you give of yourself you give to him, the more he can fill you. Okay. What we're trying for is this. Right now, that's not full. That's not full. It's filled now. Well, wouldn't that be nice in our life, in every one of our lives, if we were totally filled with the Spirit, being everything we were filled? It's possible. It's a process. And the Holy Spirit will help you do it. There's a second term that sometimes confuses people. And that's baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a difference between being filled with the Spirit and having a baptism. Yes, it is. Yes. It's different. God's aim is to get you to this point in your life. But He's not happy with leaving you there. Here's what God really wants to do tonight. To the point where you are full and running over. And that's, the scripture uses a term to describe that. He uses the term baptismal, from which we get the word baptism. Baptism means to be completely covered, totally immersed. And how can that happen? That's where we're headed. How many people here have been water baptized? Were you totally immersed? Yes. Yes. Water baptism means totally immersed. How many times were you baptized? Just once. That's the difference. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a one-time event. It's an experience, not a process. It's a one-time event. And not only were you, you were baptized in the, whole, in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that what you were done, you were immersed, you were baptized into the body of Christ. When you became a Christian, you had a whole bunch of family members. The Holy Spirit immersed you, baptized you into the body of Christ. But again, I say to you, this is an event. It's not an experience. Just like water baptism is an event. And there's signs in your life that these things have happened. For example, there's signs in your life that you are filled with the Spirit. If I were to find out what it is, it's not how many times you attend church, it's not how you how many scriptures you know and so on. I would simply do what Jesus said. Look at their fruit. Look at their fruit. And when you look at the fruit, you know the fruit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, patience, all those fruits. If those things are in your life, 
then you must be on the way to being filled with the Spirit. And those things will increase more in your life. The quantity will grow and the quality will grow. And if I see the quality growing and the quantity growing in your life, these things more and more in your life, then that leads me definitely to the conclusion they must be being on the way to being filled. They might be three-quarters of the way, they might be seven-eighths, I don't know, but they're on the way to being filled. Now, if I see some different signs in your life, it tells me that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. What signs? The same signs that happened in the books of, book of Acts in the upper room. Those disciples, especially Peter, walked out of that upper room with a new boldness. A new boldness. Fearless. They walked out with a, a new power. They did the same things Jesus did. Okay. They walked out speaking a new language. A new language. So there are signs, and we see these certain signs, it says that person has experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. So there's being filled with the Spirit, that's one thing in your life. There's being baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's another thing. And the third thing, in Galatians 5.16, it says... Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You won't fulfill this carnal nature of ours. The Bible also says in Galatians 5.25, if we're filled with the Spirit, that's happened, I'm walking, I'm growing in the Lord, I'm filled with it, I'm getting better and better, more full and full, and if I've been immersed, if I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, if those two things have happened, then Paul says, keep going. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Well, how am I going to do that third thing? Very simple. Don't climb out. Stay there. Stay immersed in the Spirit day in, day out. And what you're doing is you're then walking in the Spirit. Stay there. What am, I, what do I mean by walking in the Spirit? I should be walking in the Spirit. It means simply allowing the Holy Spirit to do in your life what He was sent to do. To do. Let Him do in your life what He, His job, what He was sent to do. This is a lifestyle. It's not a, it's not a session. It's not an experience. It's a lifestyle. And again, just like the other two, there are signs that you are doing this in your life. Like what? Well, I can tell if you're walking in the Spirit simply by insulting you, ridiculing you, persecuting you, and watching your reaction. By what you say, what comes out of your mouth, by what you do, your actions and so on, how you react to certain things, tells me, are you in control? Or is the Spirit in control in your life? If the Spirit is in control, then you're walking in the Spirit. And it's possible to get to the point where you are walking all the time in the Spirit. Very hard. Jesus did. The disciples did. If that's your aim. It depends on your aim. So let me say those three things again. Hopefully I didn't lose you or confuse you. If you're filled with the Spirit, which the Bible says we should, that's a process. Getting better and better, fuller and fuller. The glass is getting more and more. If you have been baptized in the Spirit, that's an event in your life, and you'll remember it. You'll know it. It doesn't sneak up on you. You'll know it. But it's a one-time event. Okay? And there's certain signs that show that. If you are walking in the Spirit, it's a lifestyle. So let me ask you, are any of these things evident in your life? Are any of these things evident in your life? Have you been filled? Would you call yourself filled? Have you been baptized? Are you walking in the Spirit? Okay. So I said, walking in the Spirit is letting the Holy Spirit do what He's supposed to do in your life. What is He supposed to do? What is He supposed to do? What is He sent to do in us, to us, through us, for us, with us? What is He sent? Have you got any idea what the Holy Spirit's sent to do in your life? Tell me. 
That's, that's what, is, what, what is he to do? What actions are he, is he to do? And here's a person living in you and you don't even know why. There's a person living in you and you don't know his job and what he's supposed to do. How can you let him if you don't know what he's supposed to do? That's a good start. <laughs> yes. Amen. There's all sorts of different names and titles by which the Holy Spirit is called in Scripture. And every one of those t- names or titles gives us an idea of what he does. That's why you need to study him. You need to study him. Like, like the one, for example, that Jesus used. You know what Jesus called him? John 14, 16. Let's, let me read it. Uh, you see for yourself. John 14 and 16. Sorry, John 14, yeah, 14, 16. Jesus called him, if you've got the English translation, the comforter. Have you ever read that? Come across that? Jesus called the Holy Spirit the comforter. That's the English word. Do you know what it is in Greek? Paraclete. Paraclete. And I love the Greek word paraclete. It means Holy Spirit. Do you know what it means? It means one who comes alongside. I love that. One who comes alongside you. That's his job. He comes alongside you. To do what? You said a few things, Janet. To help. To change. To strengthen. To guide. To direct. He comes alongside you to do all these things. But the Holy Spirit does a whole lot more than just that. A whole lot more. The New Testament contains at least 25 things, different things the Holy Spirit is how he's involved in your life. 25 different ways. Okay? And every one of these things are powerful and they're important and they are so needed in your Christian life. Would you like to know what they are? Two people would. I'll give you another chance. Would you like to know what they are? Good, because I'll be back in three weeks to tell you. (laughs) I want you to know. And the the one thing I I want to happen is you sit there and say, wow. Wow, I didn't know that. He does that? Really? Wow. He does it? I didn't even know he did that. Yeah, he does that. I want you to understand and appreciate and love the Holy Spirit like he loves you. Not that he's better than Jesus or higher than the Father. He's no way. But I think it's time I knew a little bit more about him. Because that does so much in my life. In my life. So we've got a date three weeks from today. Amen. We'll be here and I'll share these with you. Okay? You might want to bring a piece of paper and a pencil maybe. We'll see. But let me close with this. Are you here and you're saying, I would like to know this Holy Spirit more. I'd like to have more of him in me. I'd like him to have more of me. I would just like to know him so much more. I'd like to know him better. Is there anybody that would say, yeah, that's me? Nobody? Two, one, two, two people, three people, four people. Five people. Every hand should be up. If you are a born again believer, every hand should be up. I would like to know him. Okay. Is there anybody here that's saying, I I need to be filled more with the Spirit? I, I would like to give him more of myself. I need to give him more of me. Here I am, Holy Spirit. Go ahead. Yeah. Show him. I yes, I would. Is there anybody here that would We'd like to seek the baptism, that experience where that power and authority and boldness and a new language. Anybody here like to seek that? I hope you do. I hope you do. It'll change your life. It'll change your life. Is there anybody here that would like to learn how to walk day by day in the Spirit? Lord, teach me. I want to learn how do I walk in your Spirit every day. Well, if you mean that, let's ask him. Stand to your feet.
Stand to your feet. I can't do it for you. You've got to do it. If you raised your hand and you meant that, you simply have to ask him. So why don't you bow your head for a minute and ask him, Holy Spirit, I want to know you more. I want to give you more of my life, me, so that I can be filled. I want to be baptized in that wonderful experience, that one in a lifetime experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, I sure want to learn how to walk day by day. Teach me how to do these things. Teach me how to do these things. Okay. If you meant it, really, really meant it, get ready for a change in your life. Ready for some things that's change in your life. Because he'll honor you. He'll fulfill it. So Father, we thank you for today. Lord, it's a, a teaching lesson. A teaching about your Holy Spirit. Lord, you've given us a, such a wonderful gift of having the Holy Spirit come in our lives and live with us. Walk with us. Move in us. Teach us. We want to have a full value. Father, I thank you and I look forward to sharing with my brothers and sisters some of the incredible things the Bible says the Holy Spirit does. Father, you said it. Jesus said it. It's in your word. I want their life to be changed. I want them to be wowed when they walk on here. So, Father, I pray that each and every day they'll get up and they'll listen for the voice of the Spirit. They'll listen to you, get ready for you, whatever takes place, that their life will be different. And the Holy Spirit, you do all this for one simple reason. One simple reason. You want our lives to glorify Jesus. That's the whole purpose. And Lord, we recognize that. Holy Spirit, we don't glorify you. We just thank you for doing this in our life. Make us more effective witnesses more effective testimonies, more effective lights to a world that needs you. Thank you, Lord. Father, your plan is so incredible. It is. These things are all laid out before the foundation of the world. And we thank you that you allowed us to be part of it. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and living in me. Thank you. Give you the glory, Lord. Give you the glory. Go with us now as you go home our different ways. Give us a good week. Help us. I pray that we'll just think about some of these things that were said today. That you will make them alive. Lord, I feel so inadequate as a teacher. Holy Spirit, you are the teacher. That's one of the things you do. You are the teacher. So teach these folks. Take what was said and expound it. Blow it up in their minds and hearts. That they come back and say, I've learned some things. I've felt some things. I've had some things change in my life. Because the Holy Spirit is doing something in me. Thank you for that. Lord, we just give you the glory. Watch over us this week. Until we meet again next week. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. 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 God go with you. God bless you.